Uh, hello, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, everyone. Uh, so, tonight we have Sabio Siqueira to talk about English as a Lingua Franca and teacher education. Um, I'm going to read his bio really quick. Uh, first, thank you, Sabio, for being with us tonight. And uh, so he's going to talk about English as a Lingua Franca and teacher education, critical educators for an intercultural world. And Sabio Siqueira holds a PhD in Letters and Linguistics from Bahia Federal University in Salvador, Brazil. He's an Associate Professor of English and Applied Linguistics at uh, Universidade Federal da Bahia, uh, Department of Germanic Languages and the Postgraduate Program Language and Culture. Uh, Dr. Siqueira has conducted postdoctorate studies on critical language pedagogy at University of Hawaii, Hawaii Manoa, Honolulu, USA, and has been collaborating in the Masters of Multilinguism, Linguistics and Education from Goldsmiths, University of London. Among his research interests are English as a Lingua Franca, Intercultural Education, ELT Materials, Globalization Studies, and the Social Linguistics of English, English and Critical Pedagogy. So we are very excited to hear you tonight. Thank you for being with us again. And the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, so uh, thank you, Priscilla. Well, good afternoon. Good. Well, good afternoon for, for us. Good evening for you. Uh, maybe you will have someone on the other side of the world. Good morning. So then I'm going to get my slides here and I'm going to uh, just, uh, uh, just a second. I'll, I'll go to my slides and then you're going to hear just my voice, right? Is that okay? Just share your whole screen, please. Yeah, let me see. So. Your slides. Up. Okay, I'm going to share my slides now, all right? All right. But you have to share your screen again. I think it, it went back to your camera. Yes, uh, now you go to your slides. Okay, now I go to my slides. All right. So can you see my slides now? Yes, you just need to. Yes, perfect. Okay. All right. So uh, again, I'm going to try to, you know, to keep up the time here. And uh, again, I thank everybody for, for listening, for watching. And, uh, uh, and Priscilla, thank you very much for putting this together. I think it's a wonderful initiative. And I'm very happy to see that we have uh, so many uh, interesting topics throughout the week. And uh, I hope uh, this will stimulate our colleagues to, you know, uh, get more interested in ELF in all the implications that we have, uh, you know, uh, within the, the field now. So then this is the topic of my talk, English as a Lingua Franca and Teacher Education, Critical Educators for an Intercultural World. And the idea here is to, uh, to put together uh, ELF, interculturality, and the critical pedagogy. So then the talk is less, let's say, practical uh, and more, I would say, philosophical, even though I'm going to draw on a few data. But the idea is to, uh, to discuss and introduce how it is important to discuss ELF uh, at different levels and what, you know, we can, uh, how we can join forces to, uh, to make ELF present in the classroom in teacher education. Uh, with two, I would say, two uh, uh, fields that I think are very important, interculturality and critical pedagogy, that people, people know about it or know about them, but it's still, um, it seems to be that they uh, feel these fields are fuzzy when it comes in to integrating with, uh, you know, ELT. So then uh, this is my potential roadmap. I'm going to present key terms. So the three uh, key, key terms. I'm going to show a little bit and discuss, to have a general, uh, let's say, overview of what I call the contemporary world. Then I'm going to, to discuss a little bit again uh, what I, sh I mean by this uh, contemporary world is uh, 
more and more intercultural. Then a little bit of English as a lingua franca. I'm not going to delve into, let's say, theoretical uh, definitions because I know that throughout the week, several of my colleagues probably have introduced the, the concept, etc. But then I'll, I'm going to, uh, to talk a little bit more about interculturality, how these, uh, you know, uh, these issues can be integrated into the language classroom. Then scenario demands and research, how can we, uh, you know, put these, all these things together. Then teacher education and uh, the, the role of teacher education and, and, and the teacher educator in the conclusion, right? So basically, this is our potential roadmap. Then um, to start, the as I said, the three topics that I'm going to integrate here are English as a lingua franca, interculturality, and the idea of being critical. So uh, if you, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, critical, critical uh, pedagogy and the uh, criticality, critical ELT, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. Let's begin with the um, contemporary world, what I'm talking about. So let's have this overview of what we are calling the contemporary world. So if you take a look at these, um, at these, at this, you know, this cycle here. So this contemporary world is a world where we have basically tidal migration flows. Uh, because of these tidal migration, migration, migration flows, uh, we have new and liquid sociolinguistic environment, plurilingualism, and inter or transculturality. Uh, we are living in a world where European languages are uh, more and more learned as second languages within Europe. Uh, this is the world of where multiliteracies are becoming more and more demanded. Then uh, the increasing of translingual, increasing translingual and transcultural orientation. Then we are going to have, or we are having more and more plurilingual and multicultural classrooms. And of course, this will uh, take us to, to more and more new educational demands and needs. So then. This, this, let's say, this cycle gives us, an, gives us an idea of what we are experiencing in this contemporary world. Uh, also, this is a world without borders. Multilingualism, you know, has been more and more emphasized as the norm and not the exception. Uh, this is the world where the internet and the new electronic forms of communication have basically blown up. Uh, traditional ones. There is a proliferation of semiotic activity, so the image is more and more, uh, you know, so people rely much more on images, right? So there is multimodality, hybrid, hybridization, the deterritorialization of culture. This is the world where inter intertextuality, interdiscursivity, mixtures of genres, styles, and registers, and also translingual practices. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about translingual uh, later. So in this, this world that I'm, you know, this overview of the, the, the contemporary world, I, I see this world as a, a very, um, more and more an intercultural world. So why I see this as a, uh, a key word in the sense that, uh, you know, more and more people are engaging in intercultural encounters. And then several researchers in several, let's say, areas are bracing together to, to work and to put together uh, the, you know, the, the implications of living in, a, in, in this intercultural world. And I'm, I listed here some of them. And uh, so, for example, uh, we talk, we've been talking about intercultural communicative competence. We've been talking about lingua cultures, intercultural speakers, cosmopolitan citizenship, intercultural responsibility. We've been talking about fragmentities, shrinking of time, space, dimensions cultural growth, revival of local cultural identities, 
uh, more and more we've been talking about translanguaging or if you prefer translingual practices translocal spaces etc cetera, etc cetera. we've been talking a lot about border thinking uh decoloniality coloniality and decoloniality we've been talking about mixed languages we've been talking about uh you know more and more hybridization and of course as you can see here i've been we've been talking about elf so uh to me the uh, an intercultural world and elf are a a very special pair so then talking about english as a lingua franca as i said i'm not going uh, deeply into definitions because uh, probably you know uh, i would say people are already familiar with that but then very quickly here i have uh, you know as probably uh, the audience knows elf nowadays is much more than basically a, an acronym to english as a lingua franca Elf is a phenomenon, is what we call the phenomenon, the paradigm, and the research field. So, and uh, in a very, uh, looking for, you know, the word uh, uh, intercultural. So then uh, there is a quick definition here by Kogo when she says that Elf would be any use of English among speakers of different first languages and lingual cultural backgrounds. And I think this quote by Morinan also is, is very interesting because she says the significance of elf transcends the context of any uh, particular individual or group with English. Elf is not just the contact language where English is a domestic language or otherwise especially silent in a given community, but a known local lingua franca, uh, the means of communication between people from anywhere in the world. So this is a, a you know a quote from the you know the handbook of English as a lingua franca and uh, it's it's a book that was recently published that I, I highly recommend. So uh, then uh, if you see the set the, the, the next quote we have here that since English is nowadays the primary means of international communication, it is increasingly regarded as the most common form of interact intercultural interaction among global users. So then, as you can see, in several uh, uh, discussions and, and, and uh, texts, more and more the word intercultural and interculturality, you know, uh, appears in the discussions. The other one, for example, uh, by Baker, he says, in ELF is deeply intercultural, both as a means of communication and as a research field. Uh, given the extensive use of ELF in intercultural communication globally, ELF research is likely to provide valuable, valuable insights into multilingual intercultural communication, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So then, more and more, we see that the word uh, intercultural, the you know the con the intercultural condition is very much related to ELF. So. And then, uh, having said all this, I, uh, I, I think and I see ELF as an intercultural zone of power where power is negotiated, you know, potentially at the same level. Uh, it is a zone of power, awareness, agents, and resistance. So in the sense that, uh, you know, I see ELF uh, as a zone of uh, power negotiation where I can come with my resources, my linguistic and or, or cultural resources, and I negotiate with, uh, you know, my interlocutor at the same level. So then I don't feel, I don't carry. I think, uh, you know, if I, if I, am, if I'm an elf aware person, uh, when I come into the interaction, I don't feel that my English is bad or my English is minor or I feel intimidated by that native speaker, etc., etc. So that's what I mean, uh, ELF as an intercultural zone of power, awareness, agents and resistance. And talking about this, let's discuss very briefly the, the term intercultural and interculturality. So then uh, probably you have seen the use of the term intercultural in different, you know, uses. 
and I listed here that uh, you know a few of them where uh, within language teaching uh, ELT or other uh, texts we'll see uh, the word intercultural being used uh, together intercultural comprehension uh, intercultural dimension intercultural approach intercultural responsibility intercultural experience intercultural awareness intercultural dialogue intercultural aesthetics uh, intercultural perspective etc etc so then it is a term in en vogue it means that the term has been uh, you know it's it's more and more uh, uh, commonly used in our area so what do we mean when we talk about you know interculturality so i have here a few uh, definitions and uh, a quote of uh, interrelating interculturality uh, with language. So, uh, as Guilherme would say, intercultural is the ability to interact effectively with people from cultures that we recognize as being different from our own. Uh, Esterman also says that this intercultural has to do interculturality, the symmetric and or in horizontal relationships between two or more cultures with the objective of mutually enriching one and one another and contributing to greater human plenitude so then here the the key word is horizontal relationships not vertical relationships where you have someone who's superior and someone who who's potentially inferior and then uh, relating this to language uh, under interculturality, Mendes would say that language is much more than a teaching issue. It is the bridge, the mediating dimension between cultural, su cultural subjects or cultural worlds. And the focus is placed on the dialogic relationships on the interactions. So then uh, what happens? Uh, as I, I usually like to say that uh, each, each student is an intercultural world. So even if we are teaching monolingual, in monolingual potentially, or let's say supposedly monolingual uh, classes, each student that comes to us is a, a, an intercultural world that needs to be respected, that needs to be valued, et cetera, et cetera, right? So being intercultural involves, so... Um, very quickly the uh questioning the conventions and values we have unquestionably acquired if, as if they were natural so questioning uh you know what we have taken or we have received as you know natural so being intercultural also uh, uh involves experiencing the otherness uh of others uh of others of different social groups involving from one another one of the many in groups to which we belong to one of the many out groups that contrast with them it means getting away of all our little worlds and interacting with other worlds uh, being intercultural also involves reflecting on the relationship among groups and the experience of those relationships and of course, analyzing our intercultural experience and acting upon this analysis. So just to give us an idea of what I'm calling, you know, uh, intercultural or an interculturality. Then, uh, the, having said this about intercultural and interculturality, let's very quickly uh, put together the third part of this, let's say, the third pillar of this conversation, which means to be critical or being critical. So why I think, you know, we need to put all this together because, you know, we can be intercultural. And to me, being intercultural has, you know, I would say, uh, basically, if we develop our intercultural awareness, we are going to be critical. But being critical is not being picky or, you know, because the word critical has been uh, overused and misunderstood. And then I have, a, I have here a few, uh, let's say, insights on what I call being critical. So being critical, as defended by Freire, uh, involves conscientization, uh, reflection, disagreement, nonconformity, difference, dialogue, 
empowerment, action, transformation, hope. So why this is important for language teaching and language learning? Because, you know, uh, we learn language is not to be repeating, uh, you know, linguistic uh, features within a classroom. We learn languages to interact with the world. And in the real world, we do all these things, or at least we should. Uh, then I always advocate a critical language pedagogy, which aims to have students develop a critical conscious understanding of their relationship with uh, the world, uh, with the world. It means that this goes a little bit with uh, what Freddie has said. Before we read the word, we should read the world. In English, this is a great, let's say, exchange of words because we just need to drop the L. So read the world before the word, right? And as we know, uh, this has been very um, widespread in education, but we don't talk about these things when it comes to linguistic education. So then that's why I combine ELF as this intercultural zone of power resistance, etc., with being critical. Uh, also, align the development of communicative skills with skills which involve the development of a critical consciousness about the world and about acting upon the world, aiming at improving people's living conditions. So what it means, uh, when we learn a new language, especially a powerful language like English nowadays, we need to go beyond that. We need to to understand that we learn a language, you know, that has, that will help us interfere uh, positively in the world. And of course, I see uh, especially teachers who are critical uh, as uh, agreeing with Jihu that they are, and they can work as transformative intellectuals who educate students to become active and critical citizens. And being critical, as I said, is not just saying, oh, this is wrong, uh, even though it's part of the game, but being critical is, is, is uh, it goes, it opens, you know, doors for us to question and uh, understand how the world work, works in all senses. Since the very beginning, the material we use in class, uh, the discussions the teacher brings to class, so it makes us, uh, you know, active citizens using a, uh, another language or uh, improving our linguistic repertoire. So that's the idea, right? So that's why we are putting these three things together. So then, uh, as, this, as we have discussed this more theoretically, let's see, for example, the language classroom. And then let's see how we can put all this within the language classroom. Um, to me, I think linguistic education, what I'm calling linguistic education, because I don't see teachers only as teachers, as practitioners. I see teachers as educators. So to me, in this contemporary world that I have mentioned here bef uh, you know, uh, before, uh, linguistic education occupies a central position in, the con in contemporary life. And this is extremely important that teachers have this awareness. So, and then thinking of this world, thinking of all these uh, discussions. So I have a few questions here, but I'm going to concentrate basically on one. For example, what changes? What are the implications for the teaching practice? Which learner awaits us? Which teacher will, be, will we be seeking? In my case, as a teacher educator, which conception of language prevails uh, in, in this contemporary world? Can we still teach language as, you know, as basically a system of rules? Which materials are the most adequate to the new realities? So, but let's think of uh, the, this question, which teacher will we be seeking? First of all, we have to think that we are going to be receiving a new learner, totally different from five years ago, and of course, we need another teacher. Of course, uh, you know, as you can see here, uh, a totally, let's say, technological profile. But then it's not only this. It's a teacher that is, you know, immersed in the contemporary world. But I think we still, besides all the skills related to new technologies, et cetera, et cetera, we need teachers who are much more ideologically, philosophically, 
politically involved with the, the profession. So we need another teacher, right? So then uh, if we need another teacher, so this is the scenario and the demands that we are going to have. And then I'm going to focus on the English teacher, right? Of course, we can, uh, if we decide, let's say, to pay attention a little bit to ELF. So uh, when it comes to this scenario of English as a global language, et cetera, et cetera, so even if we disagree, if we don't think, for example, uh, all these discussions on ELF uh, are interesting, they're here, and uh, they're going to challenge us, and uh, they're going to challenge teacher educators. So in terms of scenario and demands, I'm going to begin exactly with ELF, in what I call ELF-aware classes. So then as a teacher educator, I think I should be attentive to ELF because this is the language people are going to you know, speak outside. And then just for you to have an idea, I'm going to bring a few uh, insights here. The first one is a chart by Zaido Hoffer. Uh, when she compares, so she brings here conceptual differences between EFL and ELF. And then she lists three items, lingua cultural norms, objectives, and processes. When it comes to EFL, so the, the norms are pre-existing, they are reaffirmed. So we just copy them or we repeat them. When it comes to objectives, we are talking about integration to become a member uh, in a native speaker community. And when it comes to processes, we are going to imitate and to adopt. So this means that this is what we call the tradition. We are using the label traditional uh, teaching nowadays. If we contrast with lingua franca, when it comes to lingua culture norms, which to me is the real world, uh, she says that we are talking about ad hoc, ad hoc, uh, negotiated norms. Uh, in terms of objectives, we have to think of intelligibility, communication in a non-native speaker or mixed na non-native native interaction. And in terms of processes, Two of them that are very important are exactly accommodation and adaptation. So we accommodate to our interlocutor in the interaction. And this is basically what we do in the real world, right? So then, uh, and then I have here, for example, uh, when it comes to alpha wear classes, the new scenario, the scenario and the demands, we have to challenge native speaker norms we have to value non-native speaker creativity. So remember, probably you remember that everything that is different or was different from native speaker norm, people, the teacher would say wrong, right? But you know, we know that in multilingual societies where people mix languages, trans language, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, so then we would say that uh, you know uh, we have to value uh, native non-native speaker creativity. So also we have to remember uh, ELF as a complex adaptive system continually transformed by use. That's why ELF is not a variety. ELF is constructed and constantly transformed by use. And of course, more the the you know one issue that was a big thing in the past in terms of accent. So the more varied, the more realistic, the better, because this has to do with our identities. When people say, "I, uh, you have a strong, you have a heavy accent, for ELF, this doesn't make any difference as long as you communicate, right? So then um, we, we have to learn how to translate Uh So, this means use of strategies for making sense, negotiate, negotiate meaning, co-constructing understanding, strategic exploitation and expansion of linguistic resources. So it means uh, this is how people operate in multilingual uh, situations. So then we use our strategies, so we use our linguistic resources to be able to communicate, right? 
And of course, I think this is very important when, when uh, Zeidelhofer says here, uh, when uh, EFL learners move into contexts of use, it means outside the classroom, they become ELF users. No matter what, uh, my, uh, I have been telling people that the more you can teach EFL, but your students will speak ELF. They will interact on the internet in ELF, no matter what. This is basically, and this is a scenario that is there, and uh, uh, this demands a new uh, look into our practices. And just for us to have an idea, for example, of course, we are not going to be interacting with everybody in the world, but just for you to have an idea in terms of data, so when it comes to ELF intelligibility, I'm going to just to show you a little bit of a, a study by Gardner and Turding when uh, they have they have done some research on the the ACE corpus, which is the uh, academic corpus of English, oh, sorry, Asian corpus of English, and uh, they work they focused on consonant clusters. Uh, with informants from Southeast Asia and East Asia. And they, they have found very interesting things, very interesting regularities that, you know, we would barely consider in our EFS, basically, in our EFL classes, the norm is basically the native speaker. But then, if we are interacting today with people from all over the world, we have to be aware of these uh, challenges. Very quickly, for example, they found out among several Southeast Asia and East Asia uh, speakers or users of ELF users, uh, for example, the B, the B, is omitted from the word like black, and we would have something like the black car instead of the black car. Or, uh, as you can see, number two, omission of the B and rotacism, for example, instead of B black, you would, would have wreck. Uh, omission of the F as in cl the cluster fr in free would be would be pronounced like ri. Omission of the 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 r, the r in pr, and then uh, as in probably and project, so they would be pr basically pronounced probably and project. Omission of the ra in cluster bur, br, as in Brunei and breakfast. So then they would say Brunei and breakfast. And the, the omission of the liquid L in cluster pl. So, and then we would be exposed to the word plastic like plastic and play like pay. So then uh, what happens? So this, this shows us that we, our classes should not basically, uh, you know, I think I, we need to to rethink if we think uh, of English as a lingua franca, so as a global uh, language. So we need to be aware that lots of changes and lots of adaptations are taking place every day. And why not enrich our classrooms with such challenges, right? So this is just to give us to give us an idea of these demands that are there in the real world. More philosophically, and then I'm going to be very quick now because it's about time, I would say uh, very quickly in a, in a broader view, as I said, in this profile of teacher as uh, the English teacher as uh, putting all these things together. For example, we have to see language teaching as a political enterprise. Uh, there is an increasing complexity of the profession. Uh, we are living in a world of new and mutable competences, new literacies which encompass the notion of language as social practice. Uh, we have to think of the intercultural speaker, intercultural mediation, learners as subjects of interculturality. We have to be attentive to transcultural flows, intercultural citizenship, global mobility, so more and more the countries are receiving people, even countries like Brazil, you know, are receiving people from other countries and this, the global mobility is really uh, reaching other places that in the past they were not so uh, uh, popular in this sense. 
we have to remember in this scenario uh, of interaction with alterity, respect to the other, dialogue between subjects in their cultural worlds, develop intercultural sensitivity, language to be taught as a means of as a means of intercultural communication, critical analysis, and where necessary resistance. That's why I mentioned elf as a, a you know a zone of resistance decolonization of the conception and production of textbooks and other materials. So it doesn't make any sense uh, to be using materials that have nothing to do with our reality or the reality of our students. Meaningful contents to students' social life, uh, envisioning social transformation, uh, redesigning of courses and curricula, rethinking and redesigning of assessment systems, for example, we need, it's about time that we should have, you know, we, we should design our own uh, assessment systems when it comes to the to each reality. So, uh, you know, this is a very, I would say this is a very important issue because we still keep, we still keep preparing our students, you know, to do uh, international tests, to go to places that they will potentially for them to go to places that they they don't know if they're going you know to 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 use so uh, reconstruction of a more localized profile of the future language teacher that's basically you know one thing that i consider very important and of course integrate this in what i call a critical intercultural pedagogy capable of proposing local solutions to the tensions and challenges commonly imposed by the forces of a super diverse world. And of course, in a broader view, understanding that the access to other languages is a way to arrive at a wider adventure in life. So learning a new language is not just putting together or putting in contact two languages, it's putting, you know, it's two. That's why nowadays we more and more talk about linguistic repertoire where languages integrate and we don't even know uh, for example in multicultural societies people don't even know which language they are speaking you know depending on on the situation so having said all this so i'm going towards the end so all the demands in this scenario uh i have a question here is is this teacher coming out of our university courses so now i'm going to speak more as a teacher educator so uh, in this teacher, is this teacher coming out of our university courses? And then my answer is probably not. But I don't want to be like, uh, you know, no, totally, because I know there are lots of good things going on. And uh, I would say that, uh, you know, more and more younger teachers are becoming aware of all these uh, e issues in integrating linguistic studies with different uh, areas so then i would say probably not and that's why i have another question so if probably not which changes are to be made in order to build up a teacher profile more aligned to this contemporary scenario so then i think i leave this this answer this question here for us to reflect upon then um uh, i very briefly, I would like to say a few things about teacher education and teacher educator in the teacher educator. So I would say out of my experience that in fact, we teacher educators are sort of lost and rather surprised with very comp with this with the very complex reality, which has been demanding language teacher qualifications founded on basis, practice, conceptions, tools and strategies very different from those we still use. Even being aware that several of them have proven to be obsolete and outdated. That's why I think everything that we have been discussing probably throughout this week, uh, it's something still uh, new, or at least it, it will take time for uh, teacher educators to take this into, into I would say, consideration. Uh, and really incorporate into their practices. So to be more, let's say, incisive in my in my uh, in my statement, I would say that the education of the new language teacher implies, above all, the destabilization of educators' comfort zones. 
we teacher educators sometimes because of our experience, because you know, uh, we've been doing the same thing for a long time, because we are very competent in certain areas, we, we, we naturally get into our comfort zones. And I think health studies integrated with other studies, including interculturality, critical ELT, et cetera, will take us from this, takes a, take us, will shake up our comfort zones. So that's why I would say that we need to go through a process of, uh, you know, and, and this is based on, on, on what Toffler said a few years ago, not a few years ago, in the 70s, I think, that he says, the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. So as a teacher educator, I think, and I place myself in this situation too, and I try to follow that, so then we need to learn, unlearn, and relearn. And then CFAX got this uh, and put together having ELF in, in elf aware situations, in, and then he says that uh, learn, he refers to experience, habit creation and reinforcement. Unlearn has to do with challenging existing knowledge, make room for novelty. And relearn has to do with making new connections, realign directions. So then I think we uh, teacher educators need to go through this process uh, especially unlearn and relearn. So that's the idea. To conclude, I think this is my my time. I, I have, I, I, I just, uh, you know, uh, it's about time. To conclude, I'd like to suggest three uh, books that have been recently, well, the last one, not that recently, but, you know, it was published in 2013. But three books that I think are extremely important for those who are interested in, in, in these discussions. The first one is English as a Lingua Franca in Teacher Education, a Brazilian Perspective. This book was published, was uh, edited by Thelma Jimenez, Michelle Salles El Cadri, and Luciana Simões from um, our colleagues from Paraná, from Well and Wayne. And they did a beautiful job compiling uh, chapters from Brazilian uh, colleagues. Uh, and uh, in this particular volume, I have exactly, you know, a chapter on teacher educators uh, and, uh, you know, elf and teacher education in, in the intercultural world. The second one was published uh, 2019, actually. It's a brand new one. It's called English as a Lingua Franca for EFL Contexts, organ edited by Nico Sifaxi and uh, Natasha S Santilla, two Greek, uh, very, very uh, competent and uh, inspiring colleagues from Greece. And uh, elf scholars uh, from different places uh, word about exactly uh, teacher education and elf, uh, how we can integrate or how we can put together ELF and EFL. So I strongly recommend the book turned out to be very, very inspiring and I strongly recommend it. And the last one is Critical ELT in Action, Foundations, Promises and Practices by Graham Crooks. Uh, this is a volume uh, exactly discussing critical pedagogy and, and uh, you know, in the ELT world, uh, Graham was my supervisor uh, in Hawaii, and uh, he, in this book, he shows us how we can really teach ELT, uh, or we can um, work on uh, in ELT through a critical perspective. So then, I I think it's a book for those who want to read more on on uh, critical pedagogy and uh, English language teaching. So. This is it. Thank you very much. And uh, now uh, here I have the references and uh, I'm ready for questions. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Obrigado. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Savio. That, that was really inspiring. Really, really interesting. Um, so let's see what questions we have here. 
we do have some comments. People are really excited while you, while you, uh, uh -huh. watching you. Uh, uh -huh. They got really excited when you talked about Paulo Freire. So uh -huh. we have some comments like, I totally agree with Freire's definition. Uh, Paulo Freire and heart-shaped emoji. Uh, wow, beautiful definition. So everybody got really excited. That's really uh, good for us. Um, yeah, unfortunately, I can often, so Yeah, no, no, it's, it's just that it's really inspiring to us that uh, people still believe in Paulo Freire in such, uh, I don't know how to say that, uh, such difficult situation we are dealing now in education, yes, right? Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, and so, because I didn't have the time, I could talk more about Paulo Freire and how we can integrate his ideas into language education. So, but it's, you're right, you're right. So this is the moment that we, you know, uh, we experiencing a lot of, uh, you know, let's say people are, people who'd never read Freire are demonizing Freire without having ever read one line by Freire. So then, but I, 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 I really, you know, to me, this, this doesn't make any sense because I think Freire is the educator uh, that has changed this. I would say, even though he's more respected in, you know, outside Brazil than in Brazil, but I think, you know, he, I think his legacy will never die, no matter what. So then, yes, um, yeah, we like will. We will. I think all educate, uh, educators, teachers, we are all going to unite and try to save his legacy. <laughs> um, yeah. Let's see what else. Uh, we have um, Bella just uh, had a comment that uh, that she think it's great, a great possibility to really make the students and even ourselves as teachers think out of the box. Mm -hmm. So uh, linking Elf to thinking out of the box, what do you think? Yeah, yeah I think so. I think so. So then, because what happens? Uh, a lot of, for some reason, uh, if probably uh, some of the the presenters throughout the week, and I think uh, when Jennifer uh, gave her talk, she mentioned the different phases of Elf, and uh, but to people who don't know much about Elf, still think that we are still at the level of uh, linguistic features. So, you know, even though they are, you know, still here, but I think ELF will take us to different routes and some of them are much more, at least to me, you know, uh, it is so clear that it's ELF is much bigger than basically linguistic features. Of course, they will never disappear, but it has to do with other ideological, philosophical, ways of behaving and teaching and uh, you know uh, helping students learn a language that has to be seen as as i said uh, you know to be part of our linguistic repertoire for us to become you know citizens of the world and to interact in a in a way that we don't feel we are inferior because of this because of that so then yes we need to think out of the box uh, because you know, even though we have been we we have been having access to a lot of knowledge, we still see uh, the I'm talking as a teacher educator as of course the technicalities of the profession should not be neglected. But when we when we see the language teacher, when we take the language teacher as an educator. So the technicalities are just, you know, a part of it. So then, uh, and I, I strongly believe that we should be less technical and much more political, uh, you know, uh, philosophical and work on, on in the empowerment of our students, working on these things as, and I think the ELF concept give us, give us this chance to start like untying the knots, you see? Yes, I, I totally believe in that. I think Elf is the way. <laughs> yeah. Well, 
Bella asked uh, if you see if do you uh, if you see uh, this happening in Brazil in a short time of uh, taking over uh, education in Brazil, language education in Brazil. Do you see this happening? Uh, well, I I don't I I can't. I can't tell because I don't have like uh, any empirical evidence, but at least I I see that in conferences and even in traditional conferences or, you know, there has been much more space and room for these discussions. I remember in the year 2000, when I went to, uh, to a conference in the United States on applied linguistics, there was basically nothing about English as an international language. And, uh, you know, nowadays, uh, I think we, I, I cannot say for sure that this will take over, you know, if we will, you know, really replace the way uh, English is, uh, English teachers have been educated, but at least the more we have disciplines, especially on applied, in applied linguistics, and then I'm, I'm sure this topic or these topics will be part of the disciplines and then they will become more and more, let's say, there will be more uh, of people's interest. But I believe, for example, the Brazil, if we think of the elf scenario, the world scenario, I think our country already has a, let's say, an important um representation there mm -hmm. being elf, even all the 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 let's say the products like books or materials that come out of these conferences brazil is always there so brazil is a reference uh even though uh this is such a huge country um, and I, I think uh, it will take time, but the volume, the one of the volumes that I mentioned, the one that uh, was organized by CFAXIS, was exactly, uh, you know, an initiative to show that we are not thinking of basically debunking EFL, you see, but working together. So because we know that uh, uh, a few of the, the features of an ELF classroom because you know they we have to follow a few of the let's say of the tenets that are behind EFL but it doesn't mean that EFL uh, will probably continue being let's say dominate or uh, I think more and elf will be interacting more with this EFL world that's that's basically my my uh, my view at this point Mm hmm I agree. I agree. Um, so we have uh, another question. That's mm -hmm. from that's from Barbara, and she's asking, "What is the first and most important step towards becoming an elsewhere teacher of English in Brazilian in a Brazilian context? What would you say was, is the first step to become elsewhere an elsewhere well, teacher?" Uh, okay. It depends because within the Brazilian context, we have different contexts. You see? So then, uh, what, one thing is to be a teacher at the university, one thing is to be a teacher in the public school, one, uh, it's a whole different story to be a teacher in a bilingual school uh, or in a, uh, an English institute, like uh, what we call cursos libres. So then, but if I could give a general, a general answer, the first thing for you to become alpha aware is to understand that the language that is, I mean, language, one thing is the language we teach in the classroom. One thing is the language that happens in the world. And when it comes to English, when it comes to English, you know, the, the whole scenario shows us that you know as i mentioned uh, during the talk we can teach efl but basically the world that is coming to us is elf and if this is the world so bring this world to the classroom 
So to me, this would this would be the first step for you to to uh, you know to become alpha aware. It's the real world, you see. Yes, yes, I agree. I agree. It's it's really inspiring to to know that we need to bring the world to our students uh, yeah. to empower them so they can make part of the world, right? Yes, um, yes. Let's see. We have more questions. We have a comment from Juliana. Uh -huh. uh, Ju, she's saying that Freire is our greatest thinker in education. Mm -hmm. I agree. And um, Chi Vega, he's asking, with this trend of Paulo Freire being demonized by these conservative forces, as you very well put it, how mm -hmm. do you think this could impact education in general and elf here in Brazil? Well, basically, uh, so far, that very few people make this connection with uh, you know critical pedagogy and uh, let's say not only elf but language studies so then uh, this is something that I think even though I defended my dissertation 10 years ago and it was exactly about this was bringing Freddy into the language classroom I think it's still at the initial steps so I uh, what I think we as uh, so freddy has never been very let's say um associated with language education but now i would say in the net the last uh, or five less 10 years let's say the last decade decade when we are having more uh let's say uh studies and also uh, uh researchers working uh, trying to make this connection so then we we can see that you know there has been some some uh, development but i still believe that uh, you know the technicalities of uh, elt are still very strong so then uh for this i i really let me i'm sorry being let's say using this expression but i don't care if these conservative forces try to demonize Freddy, because I believe in what I believe. And, uh, you know, if I will continue believing in his work, I will continue believing in what he, uh, you know, uh, what he, let's say, built up as an educator. And uh, I will continue as a researcher, uh, working uh, and trying to associate in my teaching in my my research with what uh makes me feel extremely comfortable uh and it's and i'm not talking about because you know people more and more these conservative forces are talking about indoctrination i don't i i i, I too this is a word that i never use with my students and i don't like that word I don't indoctrinate anybody and I don't want anybody to be indoctrinated and, and my students are extremely critical to be indoctrinated. So then, uh, so these conservative forces are going against Freddy because they don't know Freddy. So they, they never read Freddy and they don't even know uh, if they read Freddy, they will not understand Freddy because of course, Freddy, uh, if you read a lot of what Freddy wrote, we need to, 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 to consider the time and the context, you know, where he wrote those texts. But of course, a lot of what he, he preached and a lot of what he, let's say, he wanted us to understand as educators are very valid. So then my, my I think it has to do, to answer the question, it has to do with what you believe i believe you know i read freddy critically and i think you know he gives me as an educator he he brings wonderful answers to what i believe and i'm not going to change and i don't want to offend anybody i don't i don't want to you know to go against anybody uh let's say anybody's ideas and i think if we still live in a democracy i have the right to continue believing in what i believe you see so then, yes, basically, that's yes, what I, I would say. Yeah, I agree. I totally agree. And I, I, Bella just commented that you said everything, and I agree. And everybody's clapping and using the clapping emojis. And <laughs> I think you said everything every, everybody wanted to say about this 
these conservative forces, right? Yeah. Uh, and we have, yeah. Hmm. No, I was going to say that, uh, you know, they these con well, forces are here, so they will always be here. So sometimes they are stronger, sometimes they are, you know, weaker. But I think if we are in a democratic, you know, society, I can I can follow my ideas without offending people. If I engage, well, this is Freddie again. If I engage in dialogue, we can we can move on without problems. And then I I expect you know these forces to try to at least to engage in dialogue. You see, so then I prefer to live with my utopia. So that's basically. <laughs> Yes, I agree with you. And we have one last question. Mm -hmm. That's from Juliana. And she's asking, how do you think we can use impeach on negotiation of meaning in alphaware teaching? Sorry, I uh, it, it, it got a little I didn't I didn't get the second part. Uh, no problem. How okay. do you think we mm -hmm. can use empirical research on negotiation of meaning in alphaware teaching? Oh, I think uh, not only I think empirical empirical data is 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 uh, wonderful because that's a way for uh, for people to see what happens in real life. So the more empirical uh, data we bring to class, uh, the better, because then people see that oh, we're not just uh, simulating reality. You see, so then that's why uh, you know all the the corpora that we are having on on uh, you know on elf in different places in the world and we have uh, significant corpora as as juliana probably remembers uh, uh voice and ace in in others so i think the it is it is a good way to show that uh, uh these ideas and what we have been saying are not basically coming out of our you know imagination you see so then empirical data are to me extremely it's a it's a great combination for us to bring real life to class so that's why i brought you know that example of uh, you know taken from from the study with uh, southeast asian students to show that we, this is exactly what happens in real life. You see, so I, I think it's extremely, we can use, uh, you know, uh, all kinds of materials. We can use videos, we can use, uh, you know, readings. So different types of input for, for students to be aware uh, that that's basically what they're going to find out in the real world. So I, I, uh, they should be integrated into our teaching. Uh, and, and the good thing about these, let's say, these empirical data is that they can be used and, uh, you know, uh, create or not created, but they can be, the, the activities can be designed by the teacher itself to replace something from the textbook that they don't think it's, uh, you know, representative, that they don't, they, they think, they don't think will uh, really be interesting to their students. So then, uh, I think it gives it stimulates the student, the teacher's autonomy to to create alternative uh, activities. Yes, thank you so much, Savio. That was really inspiring, um, really interesting. I learned so much. I couldn't mm. like I don't even know how to thank you to be part of Elf Week uh, with us. We are going to have our last day of Elf Week tomorrow. Uh -huh. So tomorrow we are going to have Martin Dewey at 10 a.m., okay? And myself at 7, uh, bringing Elf Week to an end. So I hope to see you all there. And for the certificates for Savio's talk, I'm going to share my screen really quick so you can see the link okay uh it's the same link you have been using for the other uh webinars but at the end you just um uh, change the last two letters by uh, to ss that is sophisticated all right i'm going to just share my screen 
Just a minute. Mm, just a second, it's still opening. So for tomorrow, you're also going to focus on, oh, I'm sorry. You're going to focus on teacher education and the ELT world with, uh, with an ELF perspective. So I'm really excited to give this talk about my dissertation that is about ELF week, the first ELF week. So I really hope to see everybody there. Okay, the certificates now. I'm gonna share my screen. Here it is. So it's bit.ly slash Brout Elf 2019SS. So you have 30 minutes to go there to get your certificates for this webinar. Okay, so thank you again, Savio. That was really nice. Mm -hmm. And um, that's it. Thank Any you last much, words? Priscilla. And now I was going to say, if anybody wants to have the slides or any contact, my email is there. So then uh, I'll be more than glad to, you know, to send the materials or, or interact with the other colleagues. Okay, okay. Thank, you. Thank, so, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, no problem. Thank you for being here. Thank <laughs> so you. good night, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.